Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to my first podcast on anatomy and physiology. This is really just an introductory video. We'll go into more depth in subsequent videos talking about specific systems. But in this video, I want to kind of define anatomy and physiology, talk about some of the major themes that we'll find, and then we'll get into tissues and, and just a, a preview of all the different organ systems. Before we get there, though, I want to talk about this over here. This is an adjustable spanner. I always thought this was a crescent wrench, but a specific type of adjustable spanner apparently is a crescent wrench. So think for just a second about what are some of the structures on the wrench. Well, right here we have this movable metal. We've got a rolling device. We've got teeth. Got this long arm. So these are all structures, but what do they do? Well, you know this, that I can roll this back and forth. This will move this in this direction so I can fit different nuts. I've got a huge amount of leverage by pushing on this. And so basically what we've identified is the anatomy and the physiology of this tool. In other words, anatomy is simply what it is. What's the structure? Physiology is the function. And so let's quit talking about tools and talk about the human hand. And so there's a term that goes by form fits function. And so the form, think of that as the anatomy. So the form of my hand, the muscles, the bones, the tendons, and all of that is going to be the form. What it does, how it works, how it operates, all of those things are going to be the function of the hand and how they work. All the way from the nerves that pick up touch to the muscles, all of that is going to be the function. And so in the back of it, your head, I always be thinking form fits function, anatomy fits physiology. Okay. So basically there are a few themes in anatomy and physiology. The first one is called homeostasis, and you may think of just like a home. Homeostasis means maintaining a stable internal environment. And so how do we do that inside our home? We use a thermostat. And so a thermostat is basically going to use a feedback loop. It's going to use a negative feedback loop. If the temperature gets too high, it's going to turn off the heat. If it gets too low, it's going to turn on the heat. And so it's going to keep you at a stable internal environment. Now, what about inside our body? We have the same thing. We have a thermostat. It's the hypothalamus, which is right above the roof of your mouth and it basically is going to sense the temperature inside you. It's going to be right around 37 degrees Celsius. What happens if your temperature goes too high then your body's going to react. It's going to start to sweat and you're also going to start to vasodilate. You're going to open up the capillaries near the surface so it can carry that heat away. What happens now is our temperature is going to be depressed. If it goes too low, what do we do? Well, we could uh, get goosebumps. Those are creepy looking goosebumps. Or we could vasoconstrict, hold that body uh, heat near the body and um, constrict moving through the capillaries and now our body temperature is going to increase. This is a negative feedback loop, but it's a great example of homeostasis. And in anatomy and physiology, we're going to have to learn a number of these different feedback loops. Another thing that's important is hierarchy. In other words, in a house, you've got a kitchen. In that kitchen, you've got a sink. In that sink, we've got a drain. So we've got parts that make up that whole of the house. And same thing inside biology. We start at the level of an atom, which comes together to form molecules, macromolecules, um, organelles, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems. But not all of this is anatomy and physiology. Anatomy and physiology really begins at the level of the cells, tissues, organs, and organ systems. And so this is going to be our anatomy and physiology area. We spend a lot of time here on organs, tissues, and organ systems. As we get up here, this gets more into the ecology, so we won't spend a lot of time up there. But basically, this is what we're doing. So there's a hierarchy. And each time we go up to a bigger uh, classification or uh, a, a higher level of hierarchy, we're going to have emergent properties that start to show up. Another thing that you should understand is that those cells then form what are called tissues. And so you should have a good understanding of the different types of tissues. There are only four in humans, and those are epithelial, um, muscle, nervous, and then connective tissue. Let's start with epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue, there are basically two things that epithelial tissues have. First of all, I should not get too far ahead of myself. Epithelial is going to be the linings of our organs, but it's also going to be the outside of our body. So my skin, what you're looking at is epithelial tissue. And so we classify epithelial tissue according to its shape and then the number of layers. And so there are a few weird terms. First one is weird, and that is if we have flat epithelial tissue, we call that squamous. So this would be squamous cells. Next, if it looks like this, we call that cuboidal because it's like a cube. Uh, 
And then finally, if it looks like this, then we call that columnar, because it looks like a column. And so these are the three different shapes. Pay attention, because I'm going to test you on the next page. And then the layering. If it's a simple layer, we call that simple. If it's just one layer of epithelial cells. But if it's a number of layers, then we're going to call that stratified epithelial cells. So let's look at some epithelial cells, what they might look like. So basically, these are all epithelial cells. They're going to be the lining of organs or the outside of the body. So if we look at this one right here, that would be simple squamous, right? They're flat and, and there's a single layer. So like the alveoli in your lungs would be an example of simple squamous cells. What about this one over here? As I pause awkwardly for you to answer. That's right, that would be simple columnar. What about this one? Simple cuboidal, right? This would be like the lining of the nephron or some of the glands in your body. What about this? That's right, stratified cuboidal. What about this? That's stratified squamous. Yeah, that's what your skin is. So you're constantly losing that, but it offers protection. And then this is a tricky one here. I don't think you could answer that unless you've been looking ahead. These are actually pseudo-stratified columnar. They're pseudo-stratified. They look like they're stratified, but that's because some of them are fat at the bottom and skinny at the top, and some are skinny at the bottom and fat at the top. And so there are some of these in your lungs that actually have cilia on it. And so we would call those, let me see if I can get this right, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial cells. And so if you learn some of these terms, you're going to do well, and you're also going to impress people with all of your big terms. Next, it gets a little easier. We've got the muscle cells. Muscle cells are responsible for motion. There are three types of muscle cells. Those are going to be skeletal muscle cells. This would be an example of skeletal muscle cells right over here. That's going to move my finger, move my arms. All movement in my body that I'm in control of is going to be skeletal muscle. We also have smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is not going to be as regular as this. Um, example of smooth muscle are going to be involuntary muscle. So the movement of food down your esophagus becomes smooth muscle. Or the movement of food all the way through your digestive system, it's going to be smooth muscle. I don't have to think, oh, I want to move food specifically through a, a certain part of my uh, small intestine. It just moves on its own, that's smooth muscle. And then the third type we have, it's only found in the heart, is going to be cardiac muscle. It actually looks a lot like the skeletal or striated muscle, but it's going to have these little intercalated discs inside it, and that's going to transmit electrical signals so they can move through, because the electrical signals of the heart are going to um, create the contraction of the heart. Next we've got the nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is going to send quick signals throughout your body. It's basically made up of neurons and then some glial cells that'll help out with that. But basically what you have are all of these dendrites on this side. They're gonna sense a signal. They're gonna send an action potential down an axon to another uh, nervous signal or another neuron. So that's basically what you're doing right now in your brain, nervous tissue. The nerves throughout your body are gonna be nervous tissue. So basically, what do we got so far? We've got epithelial covering, we've got muscle movement, we've got nervous, so what's left? The last thing is going to be connective tissue. And so connective tissue is gonna be kind of a catch-all. It's everything that we haven't talked about so far. And there's a lot of things that make up connective tissue. Connective tissue is going to have uh, basically, it's going to have living cells, but it's also going to have non-living matrix around it sometimes. And so uh, two examples would be loose connective and dense connective. So basically, if I pull my skin up like that and let it go, what's holding it there is loose connective tissue. So inside there, we're going to have some collagen fibers, which make it so I can't pull my skin off my hand. But we also have these elastin fibers that are going to bounce it right back. Um, and then the more collagen that we have, the more dense it becomes. So if we were to grab a tendon, for example, that's going to be a type of connective tissue, but it's going to have way more collagen in it. It's not going to be quite as bouncy. Um, so other types of connective tissue would be like cartilage, blood, bone, fat. These are all connective tissue. All of these things connect the other types of tissues. And so again, there are only four different types of tissues inside our body. And then the final thing I want to leave you with is kind of a preview of where we're headed, the different systems inside your body and basically what they do. If we start with digestive systems, basically the job of that is to digest food and then absorb that food into our circulatory system. It starts with the mouth. It actually starts with your eyes when you see some food that you really want to eat. Next we have circulatory system. That's going to move blood and thereby oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients around in your body. Respiratory system. Here's those alveoli I was talking about a second ago. Basically taking in oxygen, get rid of, getting rid of carbon dioxide. The immune or 
lymphatic system is going to be made up of a bunch of lymph vessels. So that's going to basically going to take in plasma or liquid that's leaked out of your circulatory system, return it to the circulatory system. But we also have these lymph nodes. And basically those are areas where white blood cells will sit and they're able to fight infection. Next we have the excretory system. It's a way to get rid of nitrogenous waste, but it also serves the function of regulating osmolarity in our blood. So the kidneys are a big part of the excretory system. We then have the endocrine system. These are going to be all the glands inside your body and the hormones that they give off from the pituitary all the way to the ovaries and the testes. Next we have the reproductive system, basically different in males and females, but a way to produce offspring. Nervous system is again those nerves connecting from the brain to the peripheral nervous system and back again so we can respond to our environment. Integumentary system is going to be the skin, the nails, um, the hair, basically covers our body. Skeletal system is going to give us um, support, but it's also going to store important uh, materials inside our body. And then finally, we have the musculatory system, which is connect using those tendons, the dense connective tissue uh, to the bones and allows us movement. And so those are the organ systems. That's anatomy and physiology. Again, we'll get into more detail with each of these, but if you can remember those themes and the idea that structure fits function, you're going to do just fine.